Well, thank you very much for that, Nick. And thank you to the CCC for inviting me back. I had the pleasure of speaking at the 24th Congress in Berlin. So all I can say is the CCC must be a sucker for punishment to want me to speak again. And this has to be the biggest room I've ever spoken in. And it's wonderful to see so many people here. But you know the old adage, size isn't everything, it's what you do with it. So let's see what we can do now in very limited time. <laughs> um, as Nick said, I used to work as a British intelligence officer for the UK Domestic Security Service, MI5. Uh, this was back in the Jurassic era, in the mid to, and to late 1990s. And I and my former partner, a man called David Shaler, were there for about six years each and then we resigned in order to blow the whistle. In fact, I would suggest that in that analog age, we were sort of whistleblower 1.0, and what we're seeing now is the fruits of our labors with wonderful people like Edward Snowden coming forth and changing the global debate around what is proportionate about surveillance, intelligence, and democracy. So um, that's why we're here to celebrate, I think. Just to recap... <laughs> Just to recap very briefly, for those of you who did not sit through my hour-long presentation last time, I worked in MI5 in the 1990s with David Shaler for six years, and we saw a whole catalogue of crimes being committed by the British spies, which ended up in us resigning. These included files on government ministers, hundreds of thousands of files on political activists within the UK, bombs that could and should have been prevented, that exploded on UK streets, planted by the provisional IRA, which MI5 could have stopped, but then didn't, and then they lied to government to cover up their mistakes. Innocent people going to prison for crimes and terrorist acts they did not commit. Illegal phone taps, there's a surprise. And it culminated with what became known as the Gaddafi plot, which was MI6, which is a sort of James Bond wing of British intelligence, funding known Islamic extremist terrorists in Libya to try and assassinate Gaddafi in 1996. This operation was illegal under UK law. It went wrong manifestly because Gaddafi survived to be assassinated another day by uh, CIA and MI6-backed rebel forces in 2011. And it killed innocent people. We couldn't think of anything more heinous than that, so we decided to resign, and we ended up blowing the whistle, and we ended up actually going on the run around Europe. This was back in 1997. We had to go on the run literally for a month with MI5 on our heels. We had to live in hiding in a remote French farmhouse for a year. David had to live in French exile for three years. He could not return to the UK. And he went to prison, not once, but twice, First of all, in 1998, when the British government tried but failed to extradite him from France to stand trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act. And then in 2000, he returned voluntarily to the UK to stand trial and, of course, then ended up imprisoned, found guilty, and he was sent to prison again. So he paid a very high price for his whistleblowing activities. I paid a very high price for our whistleblowing activities. And lots of people around us did as well, because our friends, our family, student activist supporters, and even journalists were arrested, and in some cases convicted, for reporting or supporting this kind of work. But this is ancient history. I mean, this was way back in the 1990s, where. Even cryptome was a mere twinkle in John Young's eyes, although if you go on the site, you will find a lot of documents still from the Shayla whistleblowing years. But one thing I learned from that, or a couple of things, key things I learned from that, was one, how the media can be controlled. It can be spun by the intelligence agencies, even more than our government spin machine. And two, the value of privacy, because during those years, and subsequently too, I still have my paranoid moments, during those years, we knew that we were being investigated by the spies. We knew that our, in, our communications were being intercepted. We'd been on the inside, we knew how they did it. So we knew our emails were not safe, we knew that our telephones weren't safe, we knew as well that there was a high probability that there were property bugs planted in our home, even in our bedroom, 
where they could listen to everything. We also found out subsequently as well that some of our friends had been pressured by the secret police in the UK to report on us. So this is what it's like to live without privacy. This is what it's like to live under a Stasi state, a secret police or totalitarian regime. And we had it early because we did something rather weird, rather extraordinary. We blew the whistle, we went on the run. We sort of expected that pushback. It does not mean it's easy to live with. It's incredibly corrosive to the human spirit to think that everything you say, everything you do, even if you just want to have a private conversation with your mother, is being listened to by some grey person in a grey office. And you begin to self-censor. You begin to worry about what you're looking at on the internet. You begin to worry about what you're saying, what you might be giving away inadvertently by talking about your private life, your social life. And that's what we had to live through. So, roll forward now, of course, and now we all know, now we all know, that we are being listened to and watched and surveyed in an amazingly panopticon manner, way worse than we faced back in the 1990s. So this is why I continue to fight for privacy. This is why I continue to campaign against this mission creep of the intelligence services. However, this talk originally was pitched as a Four Wars talk, which may seem a little tangential, but bear with me. This is something I began to gestate, to cogitate about in the last year, because one of my hats, one of the jobs I have, is to work as the European director of an organization called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, which is a bunch of police officers, judges, prison governors, intelligence officers, you name it, lawyers, who all say, through our professional experience, we know that the war on drugs has failed, and we know it for these reasons. So what I want to quickly scoot through are the, my, what I call my four wars, and there are wars on concepts. This is what we're facing. So it's the war on drugs, the war on terror, the war on the internet, of which you are all expert, and of course, the war now on whistleblowers. And how do they all link in my strange mind, my little paranoid mind? I'll explain. I see these all as a basic attempt to subvert the basic freedoms we, in the West particularly, have fought for and spilled our blood for and died for over the last five or six hundred years in our Western countries to fight for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to fight for the basic concept of rights so that we cannot be extrajudicially murdered, we cannot be kidnapped and tortured and disappeared, we cannot be stifled, our freedom of expression is enshrined, our freedom of privacy is enshrined. So what we're looking at now, I think, over the last 50 years or so, is a concerted pushback against those freedoms. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights came into being in 1948 as a direct result, a direct pushback to the horrors of World War II. And ever since then, we have seen what President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex pushing back, trying to erode, trying to get rid of these basic rights in their own interests. The war on drugs, I think, is probably the first version of this fight back. And I say this because the aim of the war on drugs, of course, it was because it's a drug-free world, drugs are evil, drugs are bad, blah, blah, blah. We have a situation where the war on drugs has been used for 50 years to erode civil liberties across the planet in every country. It becomes a reason to, um, to break into people's houses. It becomes a reason to specifically target certain ethnic communities and imprison them disproportionately to you know, the general population. And it specifically became a reason to intervene as the US likes euphemistically to call it, into other countries across the planet where they might have other strategic interests, particularly Latin America, and particularly Central Asia, and the Middle East, and North Africa. And this trade is worth, estimated, about half a trillion dollars per year. And that is all going into the pockets of not only organized crime cartels, organized criminals, and not only the official criminals in our banking system, who do very well out of it, let's point that out, but also... <laughs> 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 
also into the pockets of people, organizations that are designated to be our terrorist enemies. It is estimated that over half the organizations on the planet who are des designated to be terrorists are funded primarily through drug money. So on the one hand, we prohibit drugs, push the trade underground, it becomes hugely lucrative, and then it creates the war on drugs. And then the other, on the other hand, we want to fight the war on, drug, on, war on terror, which is fantastic, isn't it? It's a sort of cyclical business model. I mean, some genius somewhere dreamt that up. It's perfect for the military security complex. I mean, even Afghanistan, which we liberated, and they're so grateful, and they're so happy, 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, they estimate that during the West's occupation, the acreage undergrowth for the poppy has doubled across the country. And strangely, under the British-run areas, it's trebled. And they're going to have a bumper crop this year. So that worked. Anyway, um, this is a, a major problem, but I think it is probably going to go away in the next few years. There have been massive steps across Europe in terms of harm reduction. There have been massive steps across Latin America where m many countries are now beginning to legalize certain drug use and tax it and regulate it. And even in America itself, the fountainhead of the war on drugs, even in America, two states now have fully legalized cannabis use, even for fun, hey? <laughs> And over 20 states have already legalized for medicinal use. So this war is over. The reason it's over is not because of common sense prevailing in the UN. It's not for common sense prevailing in our campaigning or with our politicians. It's because they don't need it anymore, in my view. We have now the war on terror. Brand new, shiny toy, much more effective for intervening across the planet. The war on terror after 9-11, when the intelligence gloves came off, has provided the perfect pretext, the perfect pretext, for eroding all our hard-won civil liberties in all our countries. It has produced the most amazing pretext for intervening in any country we deem to be harboring terrorists, whatever that is, or might be threatening a national security, whatever that is, that's never been legally defined anywhere. And we have the situation where it's not just our rights going. We have a situation where the president, on a Tuesday in the US, sits down and he's presented with a list from the CIA based on hearsay or snitches or a bit of you know, electronic intelligence, saying this person's a terrorist. And that is the CIA kill list that he signs every week. And when he puts his signature at the bottom of that list, those people are fair game. Those people will be attacked by kids in America playing video snuff movies, using drones to take out that person on the say-so of anonymous intelligence agents, where whole families and wedding parties and village councils are eradicated from unseen threats in the sky. That is what we have coming out of America now. And also the UK, by the way. There is a RAF base in Lincolnshire in the UK that is doing the same thing. This is disgusting. We have a situation where the UK spies have been caught out and tried and found guilty and had to pay reparation for torturing terrorist suspects, kidnapping them, torturing them. And nobody has been put on trial, nobody's been held accountable, nobody has been put in prison for engaging in torture. These might be people I used to work with, go, to, you know, go out for dinner with or something. It's just, it's just horrible. And they are being covered up for, they're being protected by the establishment. And this is all part of what I see as the growing fascism. Let's not mince words. It's a growing Amen. fascism. I say that advisedly using Benito Mussolini's definition of fascism, which was the murder of the corporate and the state. That is precisely what we've seen.
That is precisely what we're seeing. You will know better than I than about the, the war on the internet. I don't really need to go into that detail here with this, this crowd. But the disclosures of Edward Snowden have laid bare the sheer scale and depth and complicity of the corporate side of the internet as well as the government side of the internet. This is not just about trying to stop the free flow of information where they can spy on what we send to each other. This is also about trying, of course, with the copyright wars to stop the free flow of interesting information because they want to control that information and get us to pay for it. So they've got us in a pincer movement. And the corporate lobbyists, the big corporations, have been laid bare as being complicit with the NSA snooping, as Snowden disclosed very early on. But they also have shown their true colours by trying to push through all these ghastly international trade agreements around the Pacific Rim, across the Atlantic. And we need to be aware of this sheer scale of corporatism. What is going on? How many rights we're losing? The fact that these corporations, these lobbyists, can actually put these proposals in writing and tell our elected representatives, who are supposed to represent our interests as citizens, you sign here. You can't read it, but just rubber stamp it. If that is not a definition of corporatism, if that is not an analogy with what was going on in 1930s Germany, I do not know what is. And then, of course, the corollary of that, the in inevitable pushback of that, is the whistleblowers. This is, someone described it as the last ditch regulator of this degree of corruption. Not just within the intelligence agencies. I mean, you know, we've had this whole slew of whistleblowers coming out of the banking sector. We have slews of whistleblowers coming out of health, everything. They are just there and they need a voice, they need protection. And Snowden is just, an, he has done the most amazing thing for the planet. I mean, there have been many other whistleblowers in the past, including coming out of the NSA, like Thomas Drake and Bill Binney, um, and John Kiriakou, who is the CIA officer who exposed their use of torture, who's currently in prison, although the torturers are not in prison. A whole slew of whistleblowers are coming out. And the old adage that you shoot the messenger, but you do not address the message, is becoming more and more and more entrenched and it's still working. We have a situation where, in America, they have a law, the 1917 Espionage Act, that is being used against whistleblowers, not spies. And President Obama, in his two terms, has used this law against whistleblowers more than all the other presidents before. That is a war on whistleblowers, in my view. And if we don't have whistleblowers, we will never know what's going on. We need to know. Otherwise, we can't take steps to change. So we are in a situation where if we do not have these people, or if they cannot survive the process of coming forward, then we will not have future whistleblowers coming forward. And this is one of the things that one, WikiLeaks has been so good, trying to support and help people like Edward Snowden and to pro produce avenues and conduits where they can publish the information of whistleblowers. But it's also something that we all need to support, we all need to protect, we all need to encourage future whistleblowers. There is the freesnowden.is website, and you can all donate to his defence fund. I mean, he, you know, he is not going to not have a few legal fights in his future, shall we say. There are other campaigns, Jeremy Hammond, Julian Assange, John Kiriakou, even Anna Carter. I mean, this is so many of them. We need people who have the courage to stand up and fight. But if, if the ones who come before are seen to be crushed, are seen not to survive, not only to lose their jobs or face imprisonment, but lose everything, then future potential whistleblowers, and there may be some here, there may be some here, who think, I'm working in this organization, I see this going wrong, I as a single, single person, I can make a difference. One person can make a difference, such a difference as we've seen with Edward Snowden. We need to encourage that. We need to show they can survive the process. Not just survive, but flourish. So what we are now doing is setting up a sort of umbrella protective organization to help.
And this will help, this will channel funds, this will channel support, and just show the world that we value these people's courage. And this, indeed, is what it's going to be called, courage. The fund to protect journalistic sources. Many, many journalists break great stories with whistleblowers. They make the careers, it's fabulous, they get awards. What happens to the whistleblower usually? They're left swinging in the wind. We want to show that they are valued and important and incredibly brave. So there will be this new foundation, which I will be involved in. It's called Courage. I think it's a fantastic name. And we want to support the whistleblowers out there already. But crucially, we want to encourage other whistleblowers to come forward. There will be another one in a year or two, of course. And we want to make sure they immediately get protection. They immediately get support. They immediately get recognition. Because it's a very, very frightening and very lonely process to go through when you're on the run and you're being threatened with decades of imprisonment. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, you can find the new site. I think it's been registered in various names, including couragefund.ch. You will find it through my website initially. It's just being started. And we want to encourage future whistleblowers, because without them, we haven't got a clue what's going on behind the scenes. More and more, the laws are crushing dissent. More and more, the laws are crushing any resistance. And actually, that is what we need. And that's what we need as an organization, as a group, as a community to do. Because I've said this many, many times. The political process is broken. Democracy has been corporatized. We can't resist in the same way that we used to think we could. You know, civil society, protest groups, whatever. They are infiltrated, they are spied on, we are all surveyed, we have no privacy. We can't plan, we can't think, we can't write, we can't communicate freely. But your community, our community, this is the one community that can offer a line of defence. I think you should start calling yourself the resistance because that is indeed what you are. Please go forth and fight. So thank you very much for this applause and have an, uh, be ready for another one in, in one minute. Thank you, Annie, for this. She cut the talks down to 20 minutes. She could tell you a lot more. I'm so sorry you had to cut it because there was some fuck up I was involved <laughs> in too. So huge applause again, please. Thank you.